I believe in carb cycling, whereas on a high carb day would go with higher calories, would go on weak point training. Warning. You're watching Dr. Todd Lee TV, where theoretically you could learn a bunch of cool shit. Greetings, Earthlings like subscribe and share this video share with a friend share with enemies share with people who think they know everything spread it like herpes also speaking of herpes i am a medical doctor and i could be your doctor that where only requires you to click the link in the description box i can order you blood work i can read the blood work i can treat any illnesses i basically it's like an hrt clinic that's a one-man army also i do coaching dr karina dodson and i have a coaching business called apex coaching so if you sign up with me you get coaching which is nutrition programming competition prep or lifestyle coaching as well as all the medical stuff so you have three people two doctors in one business well hello there greetings and salutations earthlings it is i dr todd ifbb pro biochemist medical doctor i am here to tell you about some things that i figured out because about diet so for years i ate really bland food and tried to force as much clean food as possible and there's a good reason for that and there that is admirable and it is the best way unless you can't get in 4,000, 4,500, 5,000 calories. The previous episode of this channel was the four horsemen of the anabocalypse. And it basically covers the four most important PEDs you can use. Testosterone, masteron, growth hormone, and insulin. And I used insulin last because insulin is death for most people that almost no one should use insulin because it applies to ectomorph, hard gainer, top level pro bodybuilders. Almost no one else needs insulin. And to understand why, check out the last 30 minutes of that video. Just, there should be a timestamp that's just called insulin. Skip to that section. And the reason why I bring up insulin is because the title of this video is low fat, not low carb, not low calorie and there's a reason for that is that if you're over 40 then it makes sense to do high volume moderate weight training with reps and reserve and just add extra sets not extra load or to get hypertrophy this will result if you're coupling it with a high carb diet in sarcoplasmic growth some people dispute this they say sarcoplasmic growth and myofibular hypertrophy happen at the same time. Although in my experience, you'll see that people who use lightweight, high reps, have rounder, fuller muscles, and people who use low rep, rep heavyweight tend to have denser, harder looking muscles. Part of that is fuel utilization. That using a lot of glycogen, depleting your glycogen, refilling on glycogen, super compensating with glycogen results in more over time stretching of the white fibers which are carb driven so let's say i'm right it doesn't matter if you agree with me or not just hear me out i believe in carb cycling whereas on a high carb day would go with with higher calories would go on weak point training typically you would have to use insulin on those days because there comes to be a certain point especially as older as you get older to where your pancreas can't make enough insulin to meet the dietary requirements for your carb load. So for example, maybe my pancreas can handle 500 carbs. Maybe my pancreas can handle 600 carbs. My pancreas definitely cannot handle 900 carbs. That requires insulin. Now, maybe that's if I was more insulin sensitive, it would. But as insulin sensitivity goes down, insulin resistance goes up. They're just antonyms. Those terms are antonymical to each other, if that's a phrase, that insulin resistance is the absence of insulin sensitivity. Insulin sensitivity is the absence of insulin resistance. As you eat more carbs, insulin will go up. The exposure to the insulin desensitizes the muscle cells to insulin, which makes you ascending on the insulin resistance spectrum which then leads to needing more um, insulin, which then exacerbates the problem. And one could either use more carbs to drive the equation, 
which would result in more total calories, which means you get more fat, which means that as you get fatter, there's more inflammation. And as inflammation increases, insulin resistance occurs. So you eventually, throughout the off season, the percentage of muscle you gain relative to fat goes down. That whereas you were gaining four pounds a month and two of it was muscle, by the end of your bulk, you're gaining four pounds of a month and a quarter of a, is a pound of muscle. The other 3.75 pounds is fat. This is because of increasing insulin resistance as body fat accumulates and the food has to go up to meet these needs. This isn't the only way. This is the normal, natural, healthy way. But this isn't the only way that there is a few people who are responsible enough. Probably you're not one, but there are a few people who are responsible enough that they can constructively use insulin to meet these needs prior to insulin resistance so that you never get insulin resistance. This is not a video about that. This video is about for the days that you're eating high carb, low fat, how do you manage to eat foods you really like? Because how would you get in all the carbs? You can't just eat 500 grams of rice 10 times that day. You can't eat 10 cups of rice or 20 cups of rice a day to have a thousand carbs. There's alternatives. So alternative one, a good high carb meal. A classic example is high carb, low fat cereal and a protein shake. You mix the protein shake up with either water or almond milk or cashew milk. Find the lowest fat one you can find. And the reason is, is because if you inject insulin, the fat gets stored as body fat. So on a high carb day, you eat low fat. So you would pour the shake instead of milk over the cereal and you'd eat it. And that is a very carb dense, easy to eat meal. This would be great post workout. Cream of rice is another example. Cream of rice would be good pre workout. So, cream of rice is, you might want to go all cream of rice, but that's going to be very expensive. It doesn't taste as good. You can, if you want to slow down the cream of rice, I know I just told don't eat fat, but if you put like one square of dark chocolate on cream of rice, it'll slow it down. Some people use almond butter. This will turn to body fat, but it'll slow down digestion so that you don't crash on your way to the gym or at the gym. So these are why pro bodybuilders eat whey and cream of rice pre and post lift and why they all do it. They're doing it because they're shooting insulin pre and post lift. An alternative to this is if you like ice cream, there's low fat ice cream options out there. There's even almond milk, low fat almond milk ice cream. There's all types of, but usually if you go to the grocery store, all the dairy free ice cream has high fat. There's, you're not going to find Ben and Jerry's frozen yogurt anymore. Ben and Jerry's frozen yogurt was like 600 calories for the whole pint. Now they just have regular Ben and Jerry's, which is 1100 calories for the whole pint. What I found was, one of these guys, the Greek yogurt, this whole container is 85 grams of protein, 40 carbs, zero fat. It isn't as good as ice cream, but you can freeze it and to or keep it really cold, and it's sort of like ice cream. You could add this to a lot of meals. Like, for example, you could have waffles, and, the, you know, Eggo waffles have more fat than other brands, but you can use maple syrup or fake syrup. On the waffles, you can easily consume 400 carbs right there. And then this, you can add 50. You can eat this half this container plus the waffles. There you go. That's 50 grams of protein and two, three, 400 grams of fat, depending on how much sugar. I mean, two, 50 grams of protein, two, three, 400 grams of carbs. Another one is my pasta stuff. I make gluten-free pasta. Because why have gluten if you don't have to? It's just bad for your digestion. And you can use struline. That's 96 for ground beef. You can use, you know, people are like, what about turkey? Turkey isn't usually as lean as the ground beef. There's only 99.1 turkey is as lean as 96 for ground beef. What I like to do now is one of my favorite meals is chicken parmesan. But that's deep fried. So you can't have it, right? Wow. What you do is you take chicken tenderloins, which are extremely low in fat, and roll them in gluten-free panko breading spray it with some olive oil spray 
douse it with Italian seasoning, or you could just get the panko already flavored Italian seasoning. That one won't be gluten-free. It's not rice-based panko. That one happens to be breadcrumbs. But if you're eating gluten-free pasta and you're having a little bit of breadcrumbs, it's not the end of the world. Roll it in that, spray it again, put it in the air fryer. I do about 400 gram, 300 grams worth of chicken. It takes about eight minutes. That won't be fully cooked. You pull it out. Then you can put a little bit of marinara on it, put on some fat-free cheese, put on some a, a little bit of Parmesan cheese so that it's actually Parmesan, put it back in for another two minutes. Meanwhile, you know, you, uh, ideally you've already cooked your pasta. The best way to cook the pasta, I find, is you have a pot of boiling water. You've added salt, a lot of salt to the water, and you've added olive oil to the water. That way... When the noodles absorb the water, it's salt water they're absorbing, so the noodles already are salted. And, of course, you're going to have to experiment with this to find the right amount. I use about 8 grams of salt for 240 carbs worth of rice. And, I mean, rice pasta. And Barillo is the brand I use. A lot of the rice pastas have a weird film. They taste like shit. So the gluten-free pasta, it's rice and corn. It tastes just as good as the regular pasta and has the right texture and everything. I cook that for about eight to nine minutes. So it's al dente, put in the strainer. I don't put oil on it again. And then I can put it on a plate with some sauce and then put the chicken Parmesan next to it. Boom, you got chicken Parmesan. You've, rather than making a meat sauce with the ground beef and the sauce and the pasta, which I find doesn't digest as well and kind of gives me heartburn, I found using chicken works better. And now that I know how to make fried chicken without any fat, really, you know, you spray a little bit of olive oil, I mean, one or two grams, you know, you spray it on afterward. It, it comes out exactly, it actually is better. If you're not, if you're used to not eating high fat foods, if you're not, if you're not used to greasy foods, having fat free cheese and an air fried chicken breast, it's better because it's not greasy. It's not slimy. It doesn't taste like fat, just like the yogurt. Fat for you could taste better to me. Even ice cream. I don't like the creamy part of ice cream. I like that it's cold. I like the texture. I like it sweet. I don't like the cream part of it. It just tastes like there's this filthy film in my mouth. I hate fats, unless it's in a meat. So like salmon, I like salmon on a bagel, like smoked salmon on a bagel. I, I like cream cheese, but I use low fat cream cheese for that. But that would be on a low carb day that wouldn't be on a high carb. And of course you don't use insulin on days where there's gonna be fat. So you can make chicken Parmesan, a traditionally fatty food with almost no fat. Like the whole meal might be 400 carbs, 100 grams of protein, 5 grams of fat. Or you can have a protein shake. That might be three, two, three, four hundred grams of carbs, 50 to 100 grams of protein. If you use the whole container, that is, it's 100. And it'd be like 5, 10 grams of fat for the waffles. Of course, different waffle brands have different amounts of fat. If you go to a restaurant and order a Belgian waffle, that might be 20 grams of fat in just the waffle. And then they put 10 grams of fat as butter. I'm not telling you to go to restaurants. I'm saying you have to go to the grocery store and pick the brand that has the least amount of fat for this type of stuff. I'm saying for people who can't get in enough carbs to grow, that they have to resort to junk food, that there is no way to eat enough rice or even cream of rice to grow. These are ways to eat low fat and not buck up your high carb days. Another example is pizza. You can find, and, you know, they got bobbly bread, but I don't know how much bobbly bread, how much fat's in bobbly bread. What I found was if you take those Hawaiian dinner rolls, you can make like a deep dish pizza, or if you use um, a large burrito tortilla, find a relatively puffy one. People are like, what about carb smart? When, no, no, no. The point of the day is to eat carbs. If you don't eat car low carb shit on a high carb day, you eat high carb shit. You can take that bread, put some sauce on. I usually put some garlic seasoning on it. Otherwise, it just tastes bland. So I've got some garlic salt with a hint of pepper. That's good that I would use for garlic bread. So you make it like it's normal garlic bread. And then 
So we spray it with a little olive oil, put on the garlic bread seasoning, put on the marinara sauce, or what I like to do Detroit style is you put the sauce on top. So I would put the toppings down. So first spray it with the olive oil spray, then put seasoning, put the toppings down. I use Bako's and I get lunch meat ham, like um, black forest ham, like Oscar Mayer ham, and shred it up really small and put that on there. Put on some pineapples. And then I will put the cheese on top of that, the fat-free cheese, that's right. And then on top, and then I would put it in, bake until it's just about done, then put on the sauce on top of that and finish it off. And I know you're like, what? It's like in Detroit, there's square pizzas that are deep dish, but it usually goes toppings, cheese, sauce, rather than sauce, cheese, toppings. And there's a reason for this. It actually works better. The cheese holds the toppings down so they don't fall off. And then the sauce goes on top. So you can, it just works out better because the cheese has already been melted. And then you put the sauce on top of that. And a lot of people are like, I, I don't like that. It's just kind of like cheesy breadsticks is I think what John Jewett said. And I was like, okay, that's fair. But to me, I prefer it because I grew up here. So, and then just to be fair, all of the delivery pizzas, Domino's, Hungry Howie's, Little Caesars, Jets, everybody comes from Detroit. So we do have round pizza here. It's just called round pizza. And then we have thin crust pizza. So we don't we don't call it New York style pizza. And then deep dish is re referring to what other people call Detroit pizza. We call Chicago style pizza the, the pie, where it's like a pizza pie, where it's made like a pie. And there's two layers of bread with the topping in the middle. And then the cheese goes on top to the top layer. I don't really like Chicago style pizza because the crust is too much like pita bread. I'd like to thank our sponsor, Fusion Regenerative Therapies, where I am the director of human performance. This is the practice in which I practice medicine. I uh, will be able to order you blood work and read your blood work and help you with therapy as needed based upon the results of your blood work please click the link to get a consult with me and I can help you optimize your performance. Thank you. So that's that. That's pizza. That's ice cream. Um, oh, as far as burgers, this is simple. You got some low fat burger buns. You got either fat free or light mayo. You get regular ketchup or reduced calorie ketchup. Go with 96.4 beef. And you just make the burger patty a little thicker. And you cook it in the air fryer at like 375 for six minutes. It'll come out medium. 96.4 beef is great when it's medium. If you cook it any more than medium, it's overcooked and it'll be really dry. So you can, I always think it weird if people go to Five Guys to get burgers. It's like, if that burger's got like 30 grams of fat. You could make that at home and the burger would have five grams of fat. It just blows my mind. I can make fries in my air fryer and have it have be almost zero grams of fat. What I like to do, and when people think this is crazy, I like the I like to have more like chips than fries. I don't cut the potato lengthwise. I cut it widthwise, and then I spray it with whatever oil I want to use that day. Usually avocado oil is what I would use for potato chips. And then I would sprinkle it with sea salt, and you put it in the air fryer or you could bake in the oven and it'll come out like potato chips. So you can have potato chips that you made that are very low in fat and a burger that's very low in fat. So you can have burger and fries, you can have pizza, you can have fried chicken, you can have a general sauce chicken, easy. You make your rice, you can do fried rice even, you just use spray, I would use sesame oil basically put sesame oil in a pan and then wipe it around with the paper towel and throw the paper towel out. You throw in the rice into the frying pan, cook an egg in there, mix in some scallions. I like peas and carrots, um, but that's not traditionally Asian. And you stir that on a very low heat. Meanwhile, you would take the chicken strips, remember the ch chicken tenderloins I mentioned, roll them, crushing them very firmly into the gluten-free panko breading, that's rice breading basically, put them in the air fryer, spray them again, 
with I would use for them, I'd use avocado oil because they don't really make spray sesame oil. And sprinkle that with ginger, white pepper, onion, garlic. Bake that for eight minutes if it's 300 grams of chicken. Pull it out, put on the general sauce sauce, which is pretty much fat free. Use very little. Don't drown it in the shit, otherwise it won't be crispy. I put very little sauce on. What I like actually is G Hughes's sweet chili sauce. I like that better than traditional General Sosa sauce. Also, if you're going really high carb, you can use Red Hot, Frank's Red Hot brand sweet chili sauce. This is amazing. And you put that on there. And then when it's out, you take it out, put it on the plate with the rice. And there you go. You've got General Sosa chicken and fried rice. Tacos are relatively easy to make. You just take the corn tortilla, spray it with avocado oil, and then cook it in a toaster or toaster oven, or put it on. You basically you take like a pan, not a pan pan. You could take a frying pan, but like a baking sheet, and lay the baking sheet over one of the burners, and then the heat transmits from the burner to the whole pan, and that way you can have a much bigger surface area for cooking. And you basically just lay the corn tortillas after they've had a little bit of avocado oil put on them and spray them with sea salt, put them on the baking pan. Once they're really hot, you can fold them over and then you just take a fork and lay it on top and then I'll hold them in place while they cool off. What I would do is I would just fold them over each other and take one fork and lay it over all of them. And when they cool, they cool into that shape, that shape like a taco shell. And that's how you can make corn tortillas that are super low in fat. That way they're not deep fried. And I know you're like, well, you're spraying oil with them. I'm like, yeah, but it's going to be like a tenth of a gram of fat per taco. Remember, this is low fat, not no fat versions of your favorite foods. As far as the meat goes, you could use ground beef. If you use 96-4 ground beef, you know, that's going to be very lean. You could use tilapia. You could roll the tilapia in the panko breading and air fry it. So you could have fried tilapia tacos. You could have chicken tacos. That's just easy as shit. That, so we've covered Mexican food. And then if you want a burrito, you would just use a tortilla, a, a flour tortilla. We covered Mexican food. We covered Chinese food. I mean, obviously, you're like if you don't like deep fried, sugar-coated Chinese food, when you're cooking your fried rice, cook your chicken separately in an air fryer and, or, and toss it in. I know you're thinking, well, why can't I just cook the chicken in the pan? I find that chicken tenderloins don't cook evenly in a pan. It's just, it's too hard to get them right. It's easier to cook them in an air fryer. I've had to slice them up and mix them in at the end. So we covered China. Oh, Russia. So let's say you wanted some Russian food. There's a lot of sour cream in Russian food. Just use Greek yogurt instead. Just don't get the, uh, don't get the vanilla one. Get the unflavored Greek yogurt. You can use Greek yogurt in place of sour cream and it's protein instead of fat sour cream. This would apply to Mexican food too. Although in Mexico, I don't think they actually use sour cream. I think in Mexico, they use cilantro, onions, and cojito cheese. I think sour cream, tomatoes, and lettuce, that covers it. I like Mexican food. I like Chinese food. I like Italian food. And my favorite dishes are General Tso's chicken, are tacos, and chicken parmesan. And that is a way to make all of these dishes virtually fat-free. Burgers and fries, ice cream. You could literally eat like that every day and it would fit your macarons. Now, would you be able to digest it as well as whey and cream of rice or chicken and rice? Not necessarily, no. Maybe you have chicken and rice, maybe you have whey and cream of rice for breakfast, chicken and rice. Way and cream of rice before the gym, way and cream of rice before you get home from the gym, or when you get home from the gym, chicken and rice after that. And then at night, you have one of those meals I just mentioned. Or maybe if you've got a strong stomach, you could have Greek yogurt and waffles, go to the gym, come home from the gym, have whey protein and cereal, and then have chicken parmesan with some spaghetti and then have General Tso's chicken before bed. And I know what you're thinking, like, that would tear my stomach up. It tears your stomach up because of the fat. If you are if you eat like this on a daily basis and there's very low fat, you're going to absorb and assimilate this really quick. Now, you don't need to use insulin to eat like this. I'm merely saying that most, the point of the insulin 
is to handle the carbs if they're so high, your pancreas can't handle it. I'm not saying you should use insulin and then chase insulin with high carbs. If you overeat calories, you get fat. It's not the insulin makes you fat. It's the calories you eat make you fat. But the reason why you're eating so many calories is you're so hungry from the insulin. That's not the right way to approach this. The right way to approach this is you eat a normal diet until you get to the point where you cannot grow anymore, no matter how. You can't eat any more food. Anabolics help with the partitioning of the calories towards muscle and not fat. That is, eat, if you're eating 4,000 calories and using a gram of steroids, taking 500 more steroids is not going to make you grow more muscle. It might make you look harder, but you'll stay the same weight. What you do to gain more muscle, to gain more weight, you have to eat more food, and that almost always means carbs. Because fat's not going to turn to muscle, and after you hit your minimum, your minimum slash maximum amount of protein, more protein's not going to turn to muscle. It's carbs. Is So to get more carbs in, you're going to eventually your pancreas isn't going to handle all the carbs. You would have to help your pancreas by adding a little bit of insulin. However, when you add a little bit of insulin, and by one, two, three units, I'm not talking 10, 20, 30 units. I'm saying per meal, it might be five units. You add in this insulin, and by insulin, I'm saying Humalog. You might use two, three, four, five units of, ins of Humalog to shuttle in the carbs you're about to eat or have already eaten and that will help you handle the food you need without your pancreas quitting it because if your blood sugar stays really high it's bad one of the things can happen is insulin resistance and insulin resistance is like the opposite of what steroids do where steroids prioritize muscle building over fat building insulin resistance prioritizes fat building over muscle building in our population because the reason why because of the reason why we're insulin resistant is different from an obese person with type 2 diabetes so none of this all of this is extremely nuanced the point of this video isn't to teach you how to use insulin the point of this video is to teach you how to eat some of the foods you like with less fat so that they can fit into your high carb days and they're not necessarily cheap meals they're just alternative meals. This is how do I eat on a huge calorie amount when I'm not a big eater? I know that that is a popular method is have your dirty cheat at the end of your high carb day. But to me, you've still got insulin in your system. You're still going to store all the fat from that dirty cheat as body fat. So it makes more sense to put higher fat cheat meals that are that there's no way around the fat content like ribs on a low carb day because there's no intrinsic carbs to ribs. Ribs are a very low carb meal. They're just very high in fat. So you can put those on your low carb days. And a lot of people are like, why are you eating all this junk food? Why aren't you just eating clean all the time? I was like, I did that for years. I didn't grow. This is just something that after this most recent show, I actually have an appetite and I started using digestive enzymes. And because now I can use digestive enzymes, I, I can digest anything. So now I can experiment and come up with more formulas that'll make more palatable food because the key to the off season is palatable food. It's easier to eat 4,000 delicious calories than to eat 4,000 gross bland calories. So by becoming a better cook. And, and then the other thing is, you end up hating your food so much, you end up cheating on your diet with your favorite foods. If you can make your favorite foods lower fat, they fit inside of your diet. Not only are you not cheating on your diet, so you're not feeling ashamed of yourself because you're, I suck at dieting, I'm weak. I'm when Really, you're just bored. You're bored at the, with the diet. You have 12 months straight of chicken and rice. It's a lot harder to diet clean for 12 months when you're not hungry than it is to diet clean for 12 weeks when you are because the, sh the boring ass food tastes delicious when you're hungry. When you're not hungry, bland food's gross. When your blood sugar is 120, 130, 140, you don't want to eat anything. The only thing palatable at all is sugar. But when your blood sugar is 70 or 50, 
you would eat a dog turd and it would, you'd be able to taste what the dog ate and it would actually taste good. I've literally eaten dog food when I was on a low carb diet before and it was delicious because my blood sugar was so low, everything tastes good. When your blood sugar is high, everything tastes like crap. That's why the limiting factor in growing is food and the limiting factor in food consumption is either digestibility or taste. So fat makes things harder to digest. And if things taste gross, you don't want to eat it. So if you eat really low fat, it usually sends your blood sugar through the fucking roof because the everything hits your blood sugar so fast, you never have any your blood sugar is so high, you're never hungry, nothing ever tastes good. But if you eat with fat it, it, to make it palatable, you can get in three, four meals a day that are a thousand calories. And that's fine if you can grow off 3,000, 4,000 calories. But if you need 5,000 calories, it's really hard to eat whole foods, even high fat, high carb whole foods. It's really hard to eat 5,000 calories worth of whole foods on a day where you wake up, you do your fasted cardio, start eating, go to the gym, lift, come home, start eating. It, it literally becomes the whole day. So insulin facilitates that. If you eliminate all the fat from the diet, now you have to eat way more food. And if you eat stuff that's too artificial or sugary, your blood sugar gets so high, you don't want to eat at all. And you don't digest it that well. Plus, sugar is really carcinogenic if in high quantities. And I've seen that in myself, like doing the high carb diet where you eat 500 clean carbs and 500 grams of sugar on your high day. So it's a thousand carbs on your high day, 300 on your low day, a thousand on your high day, 300 on your low day. You're ravenous on your low day, and all you're doing is just slamming sugar on your high day. You don't digest it that well, and you look and feel like shit all the time because you're bloated from all the insulin causing water retention. So by changing it up and you're making some of your favorite meals, your quality of life goes through the roof. You're way less likely to cheat on your diet because rather than having to squeeze, like you get one dirty cheat on your low day. And there's 10 or 15 of your favorite foods and you have to cycle through them. Now you can make chicken parmesan or spaghetti and meatballs or um, General Tso's chicken or whatever the fuck you like. If there's a certain thing you like at Panda Express, you go to the grocery store and buy that sauce and then make it at home with lower fat ingredients. And you can have that almost every day if you digest it well. And you, of course, have. And then plus, when you cook for yourself, you get to track the macros and have it fit within your diet. If you go to a restaurant, you have no idea how many calories you're getting, so you can't even track it to see like, okay, I had 6,000 calories this day, 3,000, 3,000, 3,000, 3,000, 6,000, 3,000, 3,000, 3,000. You think you're getting 4,000 calories? You might be getting 6,000. I remember I went to a restaurant after my show, the Texas Pro, for lunch. I had an extra large pizza. That was very dry. There's almost no fat on it. I had an extra large pizza and I had the ice cream, which was two brownies and two scoops of, of vanilla ice cream. It was for two people. I ate the whole thing. That was 3,000 calories. Then the next day, I got a slab of ribs and a piece of cake with ice cream. And that was easily 4,000 calories for the ribs, the ice cream, and the scoop of ice cream. I mean, the cake and the scoop of ice cream. So, you know, those days were 8,000, 10,000 calorie days, mostly because of that one cheat meal. It went from what would have been a 4,000 calorie day to like a 7,000 calorie day. And then the other day was like, would have been like a 4,000 calorie day, but I had that cheat meal. And then once you cheat, you keep cheating. You can't have sugar and then go back to clean. Once you have sugar, you pretty much have to keep eating sugar the whole day. Your body won't tolerate anything other than sugar because you, you sugar is a drug and it fucks you up. So my strong suggestion is when you make these meals, even though it's your high carb day, I would steer away from sugar because once you have sugar, it triggers something in you that makes you want more. And it has nothing to do with appetite at that point. It has nothing to do with grayling at that point. It's just a completely different addiction mechanism. Hopefully you found something useful. 
Um, if you're interested in coaching, click the link in the description box. Go to the consult, set up a consult, or you can just go to toddlyandy.com and skip the consult and just purchase coaching. It's me and Dr. Jerry Dodson. Um, if you want the best supplements in Midgard or any of the nine realms, like Thor's Hammer or Fenris Fury, I mean, it's not this is Fenris Fury, this is Wrath of Valkyrie or uh, Fenris Fury. These are products I designed. I'm a biochemist, medical doctor, and a pro bodybuilder. You will not find someone more qualified to design your supplements. Guaranteed. But these are very strong, very competitively priced. Go to halahyphenlabs.com. And if you need a doctor, I will be your doctor. Click the link in the description box and go to the consult option. May the force be with you.